I'm Anthony Buglevine. I'm with the uh, Lafayette Square Foundation and Lafayette Square, which is an impact investing uh, firm. Um, and this, just so you all know, this conversation, it started in the commitment that SOCAP made to doing a track around impact measurement and management. And then a few of us were asked to volunteer to help support the development of the track. And we agreed that a missing piece of the conversation was this question of how do we engage government. And so this is partly a conversation around impact measurement and management as it relates to government. And we'll hear from the panelists about why that's important. But I'd say it's more, it's broader than that. And I'll introduce panelists and sort of, you guys will see why having a broader conversation is really important. I think, you know, part of it is we, um, you know, at Lafayette Square, we're really committed to the idea that the Global Impact Investing Network, um, I see Kelly, when Kelly was there, it came up with sort of a state of the impact investing sector. And some of us, I don't know about you guys, some of us have been coming out here at this conference for 15 years. Um, a lot of great things are happening, and huge amounts of momentum. The fact that I don't know most of you is huge, it's powerful. I'm also older than most people, which is really exciting and invigorating. But what the Jin said we need to do as impact investors is really the next decade would be defined by how we scale with integrity. There's a 100, 200 page report interviewed hundreds of people and they really came up with this idea of, you know, we've created something really powerful, capital is being put to work for a positive purpose, but how do you scale with integrity? And I think part of the conversation that's missing when we answer that question is how do we work alongside government? And, and, and part of the, even when back when this conference was being held over in Fort Mason, you know, I remember 10 years ago sort of talking about the fact that a lot of people come to impact investing because they want to do something positive in our society, but they have an antagonistic or skeptical view of government. Like, I want to make a difference, but I don't want to work with government. I want the private sector to be a solution that doesn't require government. And the best impact investors I know are the ones who say, actually, we should be working alongside government. So the purpose of this conversation is to talk about how we can do that effectively. And we have an amazing uh, group of people on the panel um, I'm not gonna read their whole bios, but we got John Samuels who was within a federal administration in the White House uh, and now runs a private equity firm, um, very successful firm that's focused on looking at this question of how do you use capital in ways that both can produce institutional level returns, which is a core to scaling, but also be really have integrity around impact. Um, Buffy Wicks has joined us at the last minute, thank you so much, um, and is within government. She is part of the state legislature here in California uh, and very well placed to answer the question so if investors are trying to work with government, how do we need to show up? Because I think a lot of what this conversation is about for the next hour is building bridges from both sides. And I think right, a lot of us come in with, there's a lot of mutual disdain and disrespect from investors who say government is cumbersome and from government who says investors are just out to, you know, make money. Um, but we have an opportunity to do something different. And then Lorraine Wilson who's with Novata, building an essential piece of data infrastructure that can really underpin the ways in which we measure impact, which ultimately is gonna be required if we are gonna show up with government and say, hey, we are different than the other investors who are here just to make money. Well, how are we gonna be able to prove that and how can we be a counterparty to government in a way that um, supports them? So last thing I'll say by means of setup is, um, I do think this is a particularly important moment to have this conversation, especially in the US. I know not all of you are from the US. Love to hear more about how this is playing out in your countries, but we are in a moment, um, and Buffy, I'd love for you to sort of tell me if you think I'm being crazy, uh, and John as well, based on your experience in government, where for 40 years there's been a sort of ideological block against investors working productively with government. And from the left, you've had government officials who say, well, investors are just out to make money. We can't work with them because anything we do to support them is gonna result in re regulatory capture or them just making more money. On the other hand, from the right, you've had people who said, well, the answer to how we engage investors is deregulate everything. And that a deregulated market is going to produce the best outcomes. And at least at the federal level in the United States, um, both those sides are starting to collapse. And I think from the left, you have people saying, we can't produce, the, you cannot achieve the policy goals of this administration around climate change, around US manufacturing, if you don't harness private sector capital. And on the other hand, from the right, you've got people saying, hey, it turns out deregulating didn't result in jobs staying in the communities that our constituents live in or us achieving the kind of nationally vibrant supply chains we need to compete in a global economy. So I think there's a unique moment where there's an opening to have this conversation, but we as impact investors have to show up in a more effective way in government and government has to be in a more receptive. So that's what this conversation is about. Um, that's the setup, I hope that makes sense. I hope that's what you guys think you were signing up for. <laughs> uh, but maybe I'll start with you, Buffy. I mean, is the premise that there is a moment when investors can engage government productively real in your experience? Uh, what's the, what do we need to do differently to make it happen? Yeah, so first of all, thank you for having me. Welcome to California. Uh, I represent the East Bay, where it's uh, at Oakland, Berkeley, Richmond area, which is about 10 degrees warmer than San Francisco. Um, 
and more affordable, although not much. Um, but uh, I'm happy to be here. I think um, it really depends on the issue. Um, you know, in the California legislature, Democrats control every statewide office and two thirds of the assembly and the Senate. And so um, we have a pretty strong like hold here in California. But I'll say, so I'm the housing chair, I do a lot of housing work and I think of housing as like, it is a public private partnership. I mean, we work closely with all stakeholders in that space to solve the problem. We've we have a major housing crisis here. It's been decades in the making, and it's going to take everyone, like rowing our oars at the same same direction to solve the problem. Private and public sector folks, um, and even with our our democratic controlled um, legislature um, on housing, it's it's pretty nonpartisan. It doesn't break down on party lines, which is actually why I really like being the housing chair, because um, it's more I think dynamic than some of the other issues that kind of divide us as a nation. Uh, and I did, I did a big bill last year, um, AB 2011, for the housing nerds in the audience um, that was taking on some pretty entrenched interests, taking on a lot of nimbyism, trying to streamline, make it easier to build housing here in California. And I was working with the Carpenters Union who partnered with the nonprofit affordable housing developers um, to come up with a set of labor regulations that they felt worked that streamlined um, the housing that we need to do, including bypassing a lot of regulatory hurdles to do that. Regulatory hurdles that, you know, were put in with good intention, but have resulted in the fact that we can't build the 3.5 million homes we need to build here. And it was with a partnership that included unions and developers with bringing in another whole subset of, of you know, SEIU, the service employees union, the school employees union whose workers are impacted, but also the apartment association, which is the landlords. Um, and the realtors and many other groups. And so it was this really interesting kind of combination of unlikely allies, of disparate interests who all came together to try to solve this problem. Working very collaboratively, we actually also had um, Facebook put money in to provide um, research for the bill because you know when, when you're in these state legislative bodies, California, we're, we're more lucky. I have about 13 staff. I represent about a half million people, so it's almost like a congressional seat. But in some of these states, if you do any state work, it's it's like they have one staff member and they meet 90 days out of the year. You know, I meet eight months out of the year. I have a, full, a, a lot of full-time staff. But even with my staff, the, the research that is required to actually put forth thoughtful policy is really important. And we don't have the capacity to do that often in, in, within our staff. And so having the private sector help to fund that research was really critical. Bringing together all these different interests. And that bill, um, I, got, I had six Republicans help me get that off the floor of the assembly. And so it actually required bipartisanship, um, which I know is like such a strange word these days in politics. Um, uh, but it, that, I think that's one example of the way that the private sector um, can work. And you know, I represent probably one of the most progressive districts in the country. Um, Berkeley's in my district, right? Uh, and the fact that I was working with developers, which is like a bad word in, in a lot of places to the left, but the truth of the matter is all the interests aligned. You know, and we had to align all those interests. So I think that's a really important aspect of this is making sure these interests align. Also, as investors come to the table, I think it's really important that, again, the data and the research and the facts are there. But it's not just coming with problems, it's coming with solutions. How am I working with, you know, towards solution? What are the ideas? I'm, you know, I say this all the time. I'm just the idiot politician looking for the smart people to help me figure out how we do this, right? Um, and so I'm looking for the smart ideas, the creative ideas where you can align those interests and you can create, you know, a coalition of really the unlikely because I have to get 40 votes. I need to get 40 people to agree with me on the assembly floor. We have 80 members. I'm one. I need 40 more people. And that involves speaking. I have to sort of power map each of those people and understand how, who speaks to them. Is it the realtors? that speak to them? Is it the apartment association? Is it their local mayor? Like who moves those people to support something like this? And so what is that coalition of the willing that's going to come in and help do this? And the, the last thing I'll say is on that bill, we put in metrics and tracking so we can see how much housing is being built from that uh, in, in terms of um, permits that are being um, issued, completion of projects, et cetera, so that we know we're actually having the impact from the housing policy that we just did, which was a very broad and grand and coalition. Yeah. And I think on that last point, um, and again, the impact vests in the room need to be at the table to help, you know, the metrics you're going to use to get the policy passed and to make sure you're on track. Um, I would hope that investors are showing up and helping to write those. I think that the challenge we face is often we run away from regulation rather than toward it. Um, just to, to follow up, and then I'll, I'll go to John on this, what, in your experience, so you said people were helpful in showing up and subsidizing policy creation and research. Did investors show up in a useful way around the metrics conversation, or was it more of a typical, 
hey, this is hard to do, don't regulate us, don't make, don't make the reporting burden harder well, than it needs to be. On the housing front, we've gone through a process of streamlining over the last couple of years. And that has been government driven because we have over-regulated in the housing space. And so I think that's a little bit of a different example. I'll say on the flip side, I also do tech regulation. And I do a lot of work specifically around, you know, social media companies and others' impacts on kids. And so that's a little bit more, I think, what you're getting at, where there's like more of a confrontational relationship. Um, and I, I've done quite a few bills in this space. A um, handful have been signed into law. Um, one called Age Appropriate Design, another one where we were tackling um, child sexual abuse materials that was pa passed and signed into law this year, holding social media companies liable. I think that's more of a classic example. And what we've done in, in, in situations like that is um, put in uh, risk assessments that have to go in, that the companies have to do. And we talk with, in this example, Facebook, Twitter, the companies about how do you actually, it's important for me as a, as a lawmaker, I can say all these things, but I don't run a social media company. I don't actually know how it works, right? And so I actually, I prefer talking to them so I understand I need to create a bill that it can, can be implemented that is possible to actually follow through. I'm not trying to get rid of social media companies. That's not the goal. I'm trying to keep them safer for, for kids. And so for me, that requires an open dialogue. And so while I have somewhat of a critical relationship with social media companies, I have a productive relationship with them. Yeah. Because as I think about the legislation, how we're gonna do it, it involves a lot of detailed conversations and that requires honest negotiating and coming to the table in a way where, you know, I believe that you are actually trying to present here a way to, so we can both achieve the same goal, which is keep our kids safer online. And we disagree on some of the stuff and we're going to fight it out and we're not always going to agree. But fundamentally, like, there's a functional relationship there, even if it's not always in sync and it's somewhat uh, uh, um, adversarial. Yeah. That makes sense. So, John, can you just picking up on that, you've been on the side of government, you were in the White House. You now work in a private equity firm. Where have you seen success in driving that productive relationship that Buffy described between investors and government seeking to create national purpose? And what has the role of the measurement been? Because I think when we show up as impact investors, we want to, we often show up assuming everyone knows our good intentions. But of course, if we can't prove how we are differentiated from other investors, we're going to be treated that way, which is totally fair. But have you seen that dynamic play out on both sides? And what is the role of measurement and managing impact in that conversation? Yeah, yeah those are those are uh, great questions. Thanks, and thanks for having me. It's great to be on the panel with everybody. And um, I will just say at Vistria, we are very focused on, on driving impact through everything we do. And you referenced the GIN's paper and all the great leadership work of the GIN, which we agreed with, which is why we went out and stole Kelly McCarthy, who's here um, in the audience. And so she, she helps guide a lot of this work as well in terms of the development of the metrics that are most important to us and how we manage against those and the work that we do. But um, if I go, can I go back in time to the, the government work, I spent a bunch of time on the Hill and in President Obama's White House um, in partnership with Buffy for a good, good portion of that time. Um, Representative Wicks, sorry. Um, um, so I think a couple things, I mean, a couple terms come to mind, you know, intent doesn't equal impact. So, you know, it's great to have the great intent, but you've got to back it up with, you know, research and with data and with transparency and um, an acknowledgement of the stakeholders with whom you're engaging. And I've seen folks do it the right way and the wrong way. I think there are um, too often the kind of playbook of um, investors or the private sector broadly was kind of go in, win at any cost whenever there was a given bill that they didn't like or a bill they wanted to advance. And I think that the risk that they ran and oftentimes how it played out was they would win a battle and lose a war, right? You'd go, yeah, you might get the amendment killed or you might get the, the bill killed or the bill passed, but then you make an enemy of some of these folks who otherwise could be your partners for the next couple decades in policy making if you were willing to do it in a more collaborative way. Sometimes that's not possible. As you said, um, in Washington, uh, bipartisanship and pragmatism are not really rewarded these days, and that's, that's a really difficult thing. It's part of why I ended up deciding to leave. I felt like at a time of shrinking uh, public budgets, we had the sequester, um, you know, it was, it, was, it, was, it was pretty volatile there, um, but there was still this ongoing huge public need and strong public objectives, um, oftentimes that aligned with the private sector more so than people realized. And I just felt like I wanted to be a part of managing private capital uh, in a responsible way to help drive good towards long-term policy objectives. And so I think the folks who show up the right way, uh, first and foremost, listen. Um, they, they do their homework. They show up with an understanding of and probe more into the policy objectives of the leadership, You know, the folks who are able to drive process from the policy side. Um, and that they actually try to get to yes. If you, sh you cannot show up in meetings with government as just 
uh, someone or an organization that tries to extract value repeatedly. You have to demonstrate that you're a solutions partner or a solutions provider and that you're willing to hold yourself accountable and to do the hard things. So that's kind of a high level take on that question. Hey, can you use a specific example of maybe your work from Vistria or something you've seen where investors showed up in the right way and were willing to be accountable in a way that's related to the measuring of impact and not just a statement of intent? Yeah, that, those, that's a great question. So I do think, um, you know, we do a lot of work in healthcare and we do a lot of work in, in education and there are, you know, really strong views on, um, on all sides on those issues. I mean, there are folks who very far on the left don't think there should be any profit in anything at all, particularly in these sectors, and then there are folks who think it should just be a free market. Um, but I think, you know, we've been able to go in and have very productive dialogue, not in convincing government to do something, but to help them understand what we are trying to do and to talk with them in advance. Like, hey, we, we're gonna go do this deal. We're not asking for you to bless it or to promise us you won't do anything that's gonna make it difficult. But as we do the deal, we're gonna underwrite a series of efforts. They're gonna help us execute against the vision that's gonna drive not just returns, but a broader social impact for a range of stakeholders. We think these are the most important stakeholders. We think you care most about these several outcomes if we had to focus in on some. We think these are the metrics that are most important to understand if we're moving the dial. Do you agree? And if you can do that and preview that and do it in an honest way and then demonstrate that you're willing to come back in with transparency proactively and hold yourself accountable, you know, that really creates a lot of room for conversation with the policymakers. Um, so we've done that. We've done that in higher education. We've done some deals that have gotten a lot of attention in positive ways and negative ways, um, but we've done all of it in, in close dialogue. I mean, one issue that comes to mind is the opioid crisis. Um, we, starting in 2014, when I joined the firm, that was at the time that there was a lot of bipartisan kind of awakening to this hor horrible crisis that we have in the country that's ongoing. Um, there were bipartisan policies being advanced. There was bipartisan agreement almost exclusively on this, putting more funding behind an issue. Um, and we decided we wanted to invest behind it because there's a huge misalignment between uh, those who needed treatment and those um, who could access it and the number of providers who were providing kind of science-based uh, treatment strategies. Um, but we went in and had a series of conversations and continue to this day with the policymakers about what we're seeing on the ground and what works because just as investors sometimes show up um, and disregard the need for responsible policy and regulation, I've been guilty of this. On the policymaking side, there are oftentimes policies that are advanced with good intent but no real uh, knowledge of how that intent will play out on the ground. And so I really, I do think it's, it, it goes both ways. That's really powerful. So Lorraine, turning to you because you're, you're building a scalable solution to standardizing how impact in the private markets is collected and measured and managed. Can you just talk a little bit about what it is you guys do at Novata? I think here people, probably most people have heard about it, but just what is the platform? What is the aspiration? And ultimately, what do you think is the relationship between regulations and impact measurement as you guys are doing it? Because in a way, you are the private sector saying we can step up and solve this. So I'm really interested to hear about how you think about working with government over time. Sure. Okay. Great. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah, we're in an interesting space where we are um, part of the market infrastructure, and um, you know, it's it's great to be in California because um, the state is doing a lot um, to engage uh, private markets, and I don't always get to talk about um, you know these positive steps towards disclosure and transparency. I, do that more in Europe, <laughs> and so I just want to make that distinction there. Um, this is an ESG safe space. <laughs> yes, yes, um, and so I'd say um, certainly we um, we look to coordinate and share information. We focus on engagement with different investors and um, information sharing with regulators and policymakers. Uh, but we're also in an interesting space where. Um, you know, we have the power to influence what's being collected. And so, Kelly, you may as well be an honorary member on the panel, but I wanna talk about um, the Global Impact Investing Network, an organization that we partnered with earlier this year that really seeks to promote um, an evidence-based approach 
and um, and has a wonderful catalog of metrics that investors can leverage. And so what we did was we took this um, organization and we essentially digitized their work um, and, and have partnered with them. And so what we see is the voluntary disclosure, which for the most part in the US and outside of California, it's mostly voluntary disclosure that you're seeing in the space. Um, so we see the voluntary standards, um, but now we're also starting to see uh, mandatory disclosure requirements. So just to throw out a few acronyms um, at the audience, um, thinking about the SEC's proposed climate rule, California has their own version of that, um, which you know, SEC regulates large publicly traded companies, but who do they partner with, these large companies? They, they work you know, across their value chain with companies of different sizes. So um, what we did was shared market feedback on the proposed rule. So that's how we um, are able to engage different parties that are involved, talk about how our clients, most, mostly private equity, private credit, venture, impact investors, how are they collecting this data? And um, you know, what is the impact of the rule? And so sharing feedback, um, really talking about different ways that we see these metrics get measured. Um, and some of our peers have even looked at the cost applications, so the cost implications. So you know, what is the cost to an organization to actually collect this data and, and to get it in the format you know, with the assurance requirements um, that the regulators are looking for? So that's just an example I'll share um, of how we've um, you know, worked, worked end to end um, to share feedback and hopefully make the, the rule even stronger. Can I, can I chime in on just briefly? I mean, we, we, a big part of our investment thesis is that we want to demonstrate at the end of the day that we can deploy capital at scale and have a strong impact, and that if we do that, these businesses in which we invest are actually going to be worth more. The only way to do that is to get at an aligned set of da data that the institutional investors, the institutional LPs have access to so they can uh, understand the performance of different managers on an apples-to-apples -apples basis. And, Full disclosure, we, Vistria, invested a small amount in Novada at the outset, but we've earmarked any upside for philanthropy. But we did it because we so believe in this mission. We need transparency, we need investment grade data around impact, and we need to align on a set of metrics that are the most critical so that the investors and the regulators have visibility into who's performing and who isn't. Just one question for you, um, Buffy. The skeptical people in the Berkeley Hills who think that all investors are just out to exploit people, and even maybe your progressive colleagues in the caucus, what, do they believe that there is a group here that are investors who are both trying to make money and with integrity trying to have impact? And if they don't, what would this group need to do in order to meet a burden of proof? Maybe it's not possible because people are driven by ideology rather than analysis, but I, I worry that we don't do enough. We, again, we assume we're sort of showing up with the intention is good enough. What would it take to from a measurement integrity perspective to be able to change that, that narrative around investors? It's a great question. I think some of my colleagues and some of my, my, my more progressive constituents probably don't think it's possible, right? And that just may be the case, right? Um, I think you do have folks who though are really solutions oriented, right? And so if you're making investments that actually impact society in a beneficial way and there's proof and data around that that can demonstrate that and you have a track record of doing that and you have honesty and integrity, um, you know, from my perspective, like, I'll work with anyone that wants to be part of the solutions, like, whoever that is, you know, and, and I think that takes also relationship building. I mean, does anyone here know who their local state rep is? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. I don't know. A lot of people probably don't. You might know your, who your member of Congress is. Um, but at the state level, there's a lot of stuff going on, you know, that, that is important, you know, especially like here in California, we do a lot of regulation. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, I do a lot of stuff in the tech space. And a lot of my constituents work in the tech industry, so I have those conversations with them. But I think it starts with relationship building, like 101 relationship building. Um, and, I mean, the example that John gave, I think, is, is a, a, very, a very good one. That, that, that is sort of, you're, you're putting yourself out there, you're sort of putting, you know, the, the proof's going to be in the pudding, you're, you're laying out a, a landmark. Um, you know, I, I know, like, I got pitched on, Ernst & Young did a big um, data analysis report around, they had predictive modeling around who they think is going to be most um, susceptible to homelessness in the UK. Um, and that is now a model that we can use here in, the, in, in, in California and figure out what are the social safety nets we can do to um, help address some of those issues. What is, the, you know, which is going to come down essentially to rental assistance, which both the tenants and the landlords like. And those are two groups of people that normally don't like each other very much. 
you know, and again, finding those like unlikely allies of how they can work together to actually serve each other's needs at the same time. I mean, that's the type of stuff that I'm looking for as a lawmaker so that we can be solutions oriented. We can work with partners who we don't normally align with. You know, as I mentioned, I represent probably one of those progressive districts in the country. Um, but I'm willing to work with Republican, dare I say Republicans when I can on things that we have shared interest on um, uh, because I think it's important because we're talking about solving problems. So, so Lorraine, on this point, um, I mean, one answer, and maybe it's more of a European or Asian answer, would be, well, government should set the standards for what gets counted, because ultimately, it's not going to be serious or a scale unless people are required to do it. I think you guys exist as a business around the premise that the private sector can actually set solid standards and create benchmarks for the measurement of impact at a company level. What do you see as ultimately like the symbiotic end state? What's the ideal relationship with government? Is it stay away and let us do our thing? Is it, hey, we're gonna build this thing for you and take it over because then it can go to scale? How do you guys think about the relationship with government from, a, from your work? It's a great question. We're actually seeing, um, I've got a tab open on my browser where Australia apparently just adopted a voluntary disclosure standard, uh, standard and, and essentially codified it as, as regulation. And we're actually seeing that. So that came out today, but we're actually seeing that happen um, globally. And so it, um, it, there's a lot of opportunity for um, coordination. Um, and where I'd like to see things get is that we see more um, interoperability, so big word that we use, where essentially you know, one way of measuring, let's say, your emissions, uh, your water use, uh, worker um, injuries, and I'm actually calling out some of the most popular metrics on our platform right now to just make it more real. Um, where there's you know, one prevailing way to measure that. And um, what we do after we get that buy-in is we're able to produce the benchmarking and the analytics. And isn't that helpful, right? And so we've, um, you know, we have the rights to, to share anonymized aggregated data with academics, regulators, policymakers. And the reason we, we want to do that is because they don't have um, the best insights into what's happening in, in, at these privately held companies, you know, big, big distinction between the large publicly traded companies I was working with before where you're, you know, tripping over data, there's data everywhere on, on any, any given topic. Um, so what I'd like to see is more interoperability where, you know, prevailing way to measure, um, it can start as a voluntary standard, we can meet with regulators, we can get that buy-in and sh share why we think this is the right way to measure and what the implications are for a large or small company to collect this. Um, one of the things we do at Novata is we think a lot about um, reporting frequency. That was a big, big question keeping us up at night when we first launched is, um, you know, how often should you be refreshing this data? And if you do collect it often, who's using it and why and how? And so we're thinking about all of it, how to measure, how often, who are the users of the data? Um, and, uh, and how do we get you to a place where everybody wants to get to, which is how do I report once and send it everywhere <laughs> to my investors, the regulators, um, and other stakeholders? Um, that's really helpful. I'm just thinking about earlier, some of you said was, from the government perspective, you want this to be about solutions to problems. Because I think a lot of impact investors are excited about the idea of, it's an it's abstraction, it's like making capitalism more effective, it's harnessing investment for social purpose, but that's not how the political system absorbs things, part of what I'm hearing you say. So it's taking an issue like homelessness. So it's just taking the issue as a homeless example. I think you said it's 3 million new homes are needed, is that right? 3.5 million homes needed in California. And that's about a little less than a trillion dollars, is that about right? If you can yeah. get your deregulation yeah. and lower the cost. So imagine a world 10 years from now where trillion dollars of price under capital has been mobilized in a way that is actually productively focused on solving that problem that you've been addressing. A question for all three panelists, what would have happened that's not happening right now that would have created the conditions in which that capital is over to sh able to show up in a way that is effective and that investors who are solving that problem get rewarded for solving the problem, that government gets the capital they need? Just how do you sort of put this all together? And we could be doing that in any one of the issues, education, health, you mentioned, John. But what is not currently happening, whether it's around standard impact measurements or you know, the argument around how people work together, so imagine, and, I'll, and after I say imagine a world where it works, I'll ask you to come back and tell me why it didn't work. Um, so 10 years from now, we've been able to like address the homelessness problem in California through a really effective partnership between government and investors bringing a trillion dollars in. What would have happened to make that happen? 
I mean, I, yeah, this will, I'll try not to get in the weeds because I could, but I'll try to have some top lines here. You know, I mean, you know, part of the challenge is we've gotten in our own way for building here. We've created too much, too much regulation in California. We've made it too easy to say no to housing. We, we developed uh, redlining here in California. Single family zoning was from Berkeley 100 years ago, which was created to exclude people of color from Berkeley. That was the purpose of that. Um, so we've spent a lot of time trying to deregulate, to, deregulate's the wrong word, streamline I think is really what we're talking about here. Um, and so that's been really, really important for us to continue to do that. We've only really started it six or seven years ago in California. Um, and now we're at the point, because the, the crisis has metastasized to what it is, we have 174,000 homeless people on our streets in California, the largest homelessness population here in the States, and growing. I mean, I have teachers at OUSD who, actually, this is a fun fact, 10% of UC Berkeley students are homeless. The best, one of the best institutions in the world. So that's what we're dealing with here. The, the shaking of the heads is the exact appropriate response. Like, that's crazy. Um, and so I think what we have to do here is, it, it, there is ultimately a private sector solution to this, right? The challenge is investors don't want to invest in housing in California because we've made it so hard to actually build it so that they don't view that there's going to be a solid ROI or even any ROI on the investment because there's going to be this lawsuit, that lawsuit, neighborhood group X is going to file a sequel lawsuit to stop the, the housing. And so what we've done as lawmakers now is try to figure out how do we guarantee that the housing can get built? How do we have one set of standards that, okay, you, you're going to apply for a permit. Do you want to pull a permit to build X, Y, or Z development? You go through the checklist of these 10 things. Once you do that, you get the permit. Right now, it's like a political process on a Tuesday night in a city council meeting where people are arguing you know, for and against housing. You know, There's people that want it. There's people that say, oh, that shadow is going to impact my zucchini garden. Not joking. That actually gets used. Um, so how do we take away the, the variables yep. so that there's more certainty that the housing will get built? And so that's a lot of the work that we have done over the last six or seven years to do that. So, that, so we need that private investment into the housing, but also we need public investment too in the form of for affordable housing. The last thing I'll say is in California, we have something called an inclusionary rate, which basically says some cities say, okay, you, can, you developer can build, but 15 or 20% 20, 20 have to be inclusionary, meaning low income, or 50% have to be inclusionary. So if, you, if the number goes up to 50%, that means the, the market rate 50% has to pay for the, the affordable. So there's always a debate between how high that number can go up. It's easy to say the highest number possible, but that means the project's not getting built. And so the data is really important on that question around what you as a policymaker, what you set that number to be. And in the big housing bill I did last year, that data that Facebook funded for us, even though I work with against them in other ways, um, uh, funded for us to understand that 15% was really as far as we could push it, otherwise the projects don't pencil out and they're not gonna get built. So I think that's an example of like how that's important just to get in the weeds. Yeah. But really it's the streamlining that we have to do here on this issue. Yeah. So, so they do that, John, and you guys, I know you're not doing this, but let's just using real estate as an example, but it could be health or the other issues. What would it take for you as a general partnership to get $100 billion of LPs to come along a strategy that says, hey, we're gonna put, our, we're gonna put your money to work around this particular opportunity. Yeah, as a, as a quick aside, you were talking about the, the homeless students and that's just, like, that's a travesty because if we lose them as students, that's a hit to our economy and set aside all the other. There was a guy in the White House who was an engineer in the building, I'll just tell this quick aside. He's from India. His name was David. We became good friends because he was often like servicing the building late at night, which is when we were all still working. And he told me that um, he spent a year homeless his first year in university in India because he had to choose between eating and housing. And so he chose to eat and he slept on the street for a year before getting an opportunity to come to the U.S. But it, because India didn't invest in him and housing or the university didn't, they lost that, that talent to the US and here he was working in the White House. So, you know, same thing here, it's in our interest. So we do need an integrated strategy when it comes to investing in these critical priorities. Like we can't have students, we shouldn't have anybody living on the street. We can't have students living on the street. We could have our next, you know, you name it, Nobel laureates uh, living on the street today. So there has to be that opportunity for partnership between government and the private sector to align on our objectives and all to be willing to put skin in the game against them. I, mean, I sound like the party for which I did not work when I was in government, but there does have to be a certain element of certainty. Regulatory uncertainty is the biggest reason why investors don't come into these highly regulated sectors. They are afraid that they won't know how to navigate, um, and their investors are afraid that they're putting money at risk and that they're going to be exposed to headline risk. 
we've been willing to kind of step into those waters a little further than others because we've been able to kind of tease out the difference, I think, between the perceived risk and the actual risk and maybe see some opportunities that others don't. But, you know, that's, that's something we've been willing to do. If you want to make impact at scale, you've got to have more certainty for the broader market. And then I got to think it has to be holistic. If you're thinking about healthcare, you're thinking about housing, you need to kind of collate, co co-locate affordable housing um, within accessible reach to jobs, transportation, um, healthcare, childcare, um, you know, uh, you name it. So I mean, those, those are a few of the things. Um, I had one other point, which I, I'll come back to in a minute when I, when I, uh, when I recall it, but I, I do think this notion, of, this notion of certainty is really critical. This was the point I was gonna make. Like CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the biggest uh, healthcare reimbursement um, entities in, in the country, the biggest uh, payers for healthcare in the country, um, they do this. They put out policies, they have access to the data they know the utilization rate of uh, you know, certain benefits. So if you're gonna go in and get your spine adjusted at a chiropractor, you're gonna get your vision checked or whatever it is, they know how much utilization there is. They know how many providers are flocking to the space. They know what they are charging because they're the ones paying them. They know the margins. And then they also know the outcomes. So I do think we have to build this aligned data set to help inform good policy, which will then yield more certainty in the regulatory environment and allow more capital to flow to these um, big priorities. So, and I'll, I'll turn to questions. If you have questions in the audience, I don't know if someone's taking them. If not, we can just raise hands. But Lorraine, your answer is, so what's Novata's role gonna play in a world in which 10 years from now, there's trillions of dollars of private sector investment capital flowing into addressing these national priorities, taking homelessness or any one of them. What's your vision for how your work will help make that happen. Sure. Um, I feel like we facilitate, not I feel, our, our goal is to facilitate a lot of these different conversations. I mean, um, if we think about the end investor, the limited partner, it's hard for them without standardization to pick between different funds or pick between different projects, understand what a manager is doing. Um, there's a quote that came out, uh, an investor said, you know, you used to just look at the financial track record of the manager, even if it was an impact investing fund, because you just couldn't compare in other ways, um, you know, the the objectives of, of the fund. And so, um, we work with a lot of the different stakeholders in the ecosystem. And so, um, ten years from now, I think it'll be a much easier story for an end investor. Who, by the way, is they're really pushing a lot of this disclosure. The pension funds, the institutional investors, the employees at some of these. Um, private equity, uh, venture, impact investing firms. So easier to understand, um, you know, make an apples to apples comparison in terms of what's happening uh, with these different um, investment opportunities. So at the due diligence phase, or even, you know, when you get your annual, um, your, your year end materials, um, easier for a GP and investor to understand where they stand versus peers or where any investment uh, stands by using um, more standardized metrics um, where appropriate and uh, for regulators to have that missing piece of, of the puzzle. You know, one thing we didn't talk about is um, the regulation that's focused on impact investors and ESG investors uh, that's come out of Europe. It actually impacts people who get their money from European investors and so clients. And so um, there are a lot of people impacted. Um, and what I found particularly interesting is that uh, funds that were previously holding themselves out there as impact investing funds actually downgraded uh, their their approach or, or their claims in their marketing materials. Um, just knowing that there's increased focus on uh, disclosure uh, so that no one's greenwashing and that's basically overstating your claim. So I think we'll just be able to uh, differentiate between different offerings more clearly and um, choice is nice and uh, you know it uh, I think it'll really revolutionize this, this space and once we get to a point where there's more data out there and, and people really understand what's happening. We're working on it now. Um, there's a lot of movement in the space, but it um, be interesting to see. So we do, we do have one question in the audience. Before I get to that, I just want to turn this around and say, what if it's 10 years from now and we're still having the same conversation? So investors are still on the margins, not really engaging with government. Government still doesn't have the resources they need to mobilize. Um, why, wh what is your biggest worry if that's where we are 10 years from now, what do you think is the reason that would have happened? I'm sure there are lots of reasons. If I give everyone one, only one minute, 
what do you think is the most oh. likely? So we're going to do a pre-mortem. Like the ambition of this conversation, it's on the slab, and we're trying to understand why did this idea that we could work together as investors in government die? Uh, what, what's the one thing that you think killed it? I mean, in, in my example, I think it's inertia and status quo won the day. You know, we didn't break through. We didn't align the interests and align the stars. Uh, where this could be a win-win-win, you know, but it requires leadership to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think unlikely allies and people coming together to actually try to solve problems, which in politics, we don't have a great track record of doing that. I hate to admit it. Um, but I think it would be that the status quo and inertia won the day. And I'd say my experience, inertia is not just a political concern. It's, it's the problem of the asset management industry, too. Too many people in power have made been too successful doing things the same way to be open to change. But, John, if you had a thought. Um, I mean, one thing I wanted to say is that it will probably mean we didn't get campaign finance reform finally done and, and get money out of politics because, you know, so much of it influences the process. Not here, not with this representative, <laughs> but I'm thinking more about D.C. Um, but, you know, just, you know, our, that our politics is still, you know, really flawed and volatile and solutions are not rewarded and valued. But um, the other thing is on the investor side, it would mean that we failed to demonstrate with data uh, that the work we're doing is having a positive impact um, on the lives that we touch through our investments and or that we were unwilling to, to share the data behind the work that we do. I'll throw in another element and, and it's that we all have our own way of describing our, our impact and, um, and, and then we're only speaking to our small um, cohort. So, um, that, that to me would be a failure, is that we, we literally don't have the vocabulary to speak to one another and, and describe our, our um, efforts in space. That's great. Well, thanks, everyone. So um, if you have more questions, uh, I think the process is write them down and we'll get them. So we did, I don't know if someone, whoever wrote this, uh, might want to identify yourself. You don't have to. But we did a great question. How, how might funders build bridges with communities to drive community-informed and led measures? Uh, so the question of, and maybe it's about skipping government or working with government, but how do we not just talk about government as a partner? I think the question is, how do we also make sure that the measure of impact is informed by the communities who we claim to be making a difference on behalf of? I actually think that's a great question, because if someone's coming in claiming to speak for someone else and all the great things they're doing for that constituency, I'm like, I want to talk to the constituency, you know? And so I think that partnership's actually really important, and that's where... You know, every time I get pitched a bill idea, I want to know, like, who are all the stakeholders? Where are they all at? Where's the politics on this going to align? And how are we um, having truly authentic conversations about how this work or whatever this potential regulation would be, how it actually impacts those folks? Um, which I think, again, comes back to relationship building and having that kind of dialogue and conversation. I mean, the other thing that's, I'm sure you all do this sort of stuff, but like, White papers are very important. Put that data out there. Make it public. Make it so that we can see it. Um, have that kind of public conversation about it, but do it in alignment with the communities with which you're purporting to help. Kelly's working on a really important white paper right now. We're going to be excited to put out, but um, that's around the, our impact measurement and management work. I mean, there is. It's interesting. There is. I mean, there is a um, practice called community informed budgeting. So some some municipalities have this, where a portion of the budget is carved out and the community gets to weigh in on how it's spent and um, you know it's nascent but that that is coming to work but I you know I agree you, you know one should not uh, present as representing a community if you can't back that up yeah. um, and or you know and again the intent intent doesn't doesn't equal the impact if you're saying you're gonna do all these things it's gonna be so wonderful for the community but you don't understand how to go and measure progress as you go then you know that's a real problem and then from, from our perspective, it's in the case studies and the, um, the survey information. So just hearing that firsthand information on um, you know, what, what happened as part of, what was the outcome? Yeah. That's great. Anyone else have questions from the audience? Um, so when I don't get questions, I, I do this. I've not prepped the panel for this, so apologies, guys. Um, so here's how I like to sort of end this, maybe a minute or two. What is a question you wish you had been asked? In the context of this topic of impact measurement, working with government, what is the question you think we should have asked you or someone out here should have asked you and either answer it yourself or if there's a question you think a panel, one of your fellow panelists should have been asked, ask them and I'll give them your time. If somebody asks a question now from the audience, are we off the hook or are we guys yeah. just <laughs> Come on, guys. He's stressing out now. Um, so I'll give, you, I'll give you a second. But just think about what, what on this topic, what are we not talking about that we should be? 
Um, and you're happy to take an answer or, or pose it to your fellow panelists. I, oh, do you want to go? <laughs> go ahead. You, you, he's not off the hook entirely, but. think I need this, but okay. Um, I need it for the video. <laughs> got it. Um, how do we as organizations that may have a very specific focus on whatever the issue is, work with um, our elected officials, what have you, that are very siloed um, to have conversations to really break down these silos? So um, I focus on housing, but food insecurity is a real issue, and it's very connected to housing and we have a state representative that focuses on housing you're very awesome by the way um, but how do we break down these silos when we're talking to our elected officials um, to really address the the issues as a whole versus in these very individualized silos because I think that um, continues to be a challenge as, um, as well when we try to look at our issues um, and we're just addressing one piece of the puzzle, which mm -hmm. has ripple effects on other pieces. So how do we come together with our elected officials to you know, address the whole puzzle, not just a piece of it? Sure, that's a great question. One, one tool that I have found to be very helpful as a lawmaker is when um, a coalition of groups get together and put forth a blueprint. So putting forth a blueprint around economic security, right, where you're hitting on housing costs, food insecurity, you know, pick a handful of things that that you all feel as a coalition, you can say, here's our 10 year vision of how we're gonna actually create economic security for working families. And it's these 10 groups that have come together to align around a series of policy bills. And then it, it gives lawmakers, because here's the reality, right? Like I go into session in January, 80 of my colleagues and I, we're all gonna put forth our like 15 bills. We all want our little press release and our little Twitter post and our all the things so we get the recognition and so we can go out there and say, we're fighting for you constituents, right? And so, we're kind of, we're, we're looking for direction from, from leaders around what are the things that we can do so that we're all actually working in coordination as opposed to us having 15 little bills on the margin but a handful of big ones and then how do we, what do we accompany those with? So blueprints have been very effective. We did this actually around childcare costs in California starting about 10 years ago and it was a whole coalition of a lot of different organizations coming together on the child, cost of childcare. And over the last 10 years, we've really worked on solving that problem and it's been this blueprint that's really worked we did the same thing with abortion. The Future of Abortion Council got together before the Supreme Court decision and said, here's the 15 things California needs to do to make sure that we have safe and legal abortion here. And the Women's Caucus, everyone took a bill and we all kind of ran with it. So you're kind of giving lawmakers direction on what do you, in coalition with a series of other groups, want to see done to help impact working families. And that's my answer. So there you go. I got off the hook. I'm, I'm going to piggyback on that one. So I am. Um, I allowed, we didn't call it the blueprint, but that was the idea, and it was um, in the muni bond space, and um, it was essentially, I was at a nonprofit at the time, and we were sort of the facilitator for these conversations because the investors didn't want to talk to each other directly. They were fierce, fierce competitors, and so think, you know, cast a wide net as you think about who could be part of that blueprint group. Um, in our case, we brought the research expertise and helped basically get into the measurement, what's our unit of measurement, how are we gonna do this? Um, that was our, our value add to the conversation. So both bringing together unlikely um, groups, um, unlikely collaborators, um, and also helping on the, the measurement side. But I'd say, yeah, cast a wide net in terms of who could help with that work. And what's interesting is the other side of it, the people we were trying to get to disclose, the issuers said, hey, could you bring in the regulators? and mandate this because I don't have the buy-in politically to, to just voluntarily disclose this. And so actually everybody was incentivized to be part of this, um, this group. It was, you know, please tell me I have to report this because as, as many of us know in the room, a lot of these social and environmental um, issues have become politicized when really it's, it's the investors want the information, the end investors, the asset managers. Um, so. 
I think uh, I'm just, I don't know what the question would have been to frame this, but I try to raise this wherever we go. Um, you know, uh, the private investment, private equity has, you know, pretty bad reputation broadly. There's a, a ton of skepticism, um, real lack of trust, and that's because, you know, a lot of the behaviors in the past have earned it, but also I think, you know, part of it is um, how can you go and represent that you, um, you know, are advancing good outcomes on behalf of all these communities in our country when you're in an industry where everyone looks like me? Not everyone, but too many. And so I think, you know, um, I hope investors and all the other stakeholders hold us accountable and our colleagues accountable for what we're doing on a systematic basis to change that. You know, we have a number of strategies underway. I'm not saying we're perfect or the best, but we have a lot of intention around advancing diversity in every way, diversity of thought, racial and ethnic diversity in leadership on down in the, in the work that we do um, so that we can run better companies and ensure that the best and brightest talent aren't on the sidelines, but also that we are informed by the perspectives of communities um, that we are we're trying to have an impact on. Yeah. So just, and maybe it's a little bit of a depressing place to finish up, hopefully not, but just picking up on that, it just strikes me having this conversation, we're here, we're in a safe space, you're gonna go back to Berkeley, for a lot of people in America, certainly, we should be fighting a rear guard. I mean, this is all an insane conversation because instead they're like taking out even the ESG, you know, the whole movement that says you can't even measure basic ESG because, so I, I don't want to leave this conversation without at least addressing that. Because on one hand, we're talking about the future and how much we can move this forward in a reality where in half the, represent, the rep people who represent half of the people in this country, basically, at a federal level, are wanting to like strip down even the minimal of progress that's been achieved around ESG reporting and ratings. So just a quick prognosis from the panel on where do, you, where do you think that all plays out? I mean, you guys have built a business premised on going long on ESG and data and metrics. I mean, you have as well. I mean, you know, all of you guys represent in some way a view that that might, you know, that's not going to be taking down all the ESG data reporting. It's not where this society is going to move. So. Any last thoughts on kind of how, how you see this work differently because of that movement and what are we going to do about it? Yeah, I, I think it's up to us to engage. I, I don't think we can only talk to people who agree with us, um, who recognize the importance of these topics. Um, Education is a huge part of it. So I read everything. I, I want to read from, you know, skeptics and, and, and people who you know, agree, who I see at conferences. Um, and a lot of what I see um, when people are skeptical, I, I do think that there's a big misunderstanding a lot of the times, even in the definition of what impact investing is. And one of the earlier panels was talking about you know, the fact that many impact investors are looking for market rate returns. So, you know, it's first, let's do our education, let's make sure we're all talking about the same thing. Um, and I, I, I think that goes a very long way. Um, a couple things on that question. I think it's an important one. So it, the first two Republican debates, that issue didn't come up. And I thought that that was interesting because I kind of would have expected it to. If it was a winning issue, somebody would have leaned into it. So maybe it's not polling as well as they thought. Um, maybe it's just you know useful in the moment, but not for like a broad, a broad strategy. I mean, my objective opinion is a lot of this is the fossil fuel industry putting this issue up front because they're pushing back against the movement around climate specifically, not all the other things that we're doing, which really emerged as financial risk mitigation tools and value creation tools. And so on some level, and I had this play out a lot when I was in Washington, you know, you get in a room with a lawmaker and they'd say, John, I totally agree with you and the president, but I can't go out there and say that. Or like, I'll get primaried and I'll be out of here and you'll have somebody way more extreme than me. So there is part of it where folks have to grab onto what they think is popular sentiment right now and it's a proxy for other things. Um, I'm hoping it dies out. I'm not terribly confident our politics are gonna get much better before they get maybe a little worse. Um, but at the end of the day, we're going long on these matters. Our LPs, the institutional investors on down, have told us they want us to charge ahead. Not just because they're morally aligned with what we're doing, but because they do see this work as a value creation tool, and so do we. So we're going to keep charging ahead and test the bounds of what we can do. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to continue to be fraught because the country is very divided. I'd say it divided in some ways. I mean, my, my last role was with an organization that surveyed hundreds of thousands of Americans every year, and we saw consensus on the issues. If, if you're talking about worker issues, a, a lot of these different metrics that we're measuring, um, there's consensus in terms of them being important. Workers getting injured on the job, you're right about the risks and opportunities. Business owners have been collecting these metrics forever. I mean, it just used to be a compliance function, but now it's you know under the ESG umbrella. So um, I actually I do think there's more consensus, especially for someone who's 
um, running their business, thinking about the long term, or just an everyday person um, who's out there working, maybe trying to support uh, themselves or themselves in a family. Can I, I just want to build on that. I actually think it's a really good point. Part of what's a challenge here is the language. So some of these terms and um, words are triggers. So when you say ESG or impact or whatever, people don't like that. Like I had a, one CEO of a business we were looking to buy, and I talked about DEI, and he says, oh, that sounds political. And I said, well, no, it's not. Let me walk you through what that means. You just told me you've got a, a, like a fight for talent. You've got people leaving. That's one of your biggest challenges. Why would you want to leave talent on the sideline? Do you want to make sure you've got best-in-class compliance? Yes, of course. Do you want to make sure you're guarding against cyber threats? Yes, of course. Do you want to make sure that if you say you are good, you can prove it? Right? And what do you think consumers want? Every consumer going to a doctor wants to make sure they're getting good care. How do you measure that? Right? So, yeah, I agree with you. That's a great point. So, uh, last word, and then I think we're going to hand it over. We do a little network session out front. I was just saying, after the 2016 election, I stopped predicting anything because I learned my lesson. <laughs> and my focus is just focus on solutions. Yeah. So that is where my, that's my space. Yeah. But really helpful. I mean, the idea of focus on solutions, leave the language in service of progress. I think that's really important. Um, and then, you know, we have to be able to see, I mean, I think to your point, Lorraine, in all the despair, there's a lot that we find the commonality that exists, which is underneath, it's the data underneath the noise.